Hello. <laughs> wow. Good evening. I have three total fans. I appreciate each, each of you. <laughs> We're so grateful you're here. Welcome to our event, Women in Christianity, a history of faith, struggle, and valor. I wanted to get it in the right order, you know? Uh, this, is, this event is a collaboration between the Center for Women's Studies and uh, Professor, Dr. Reverend Rebecca Laird. It was, yeah, that deserves a round of applause. This was, in fact, her idea to gather um, these 10 faculty members here. And I have to say, it's a relatively rare occasion where we get to gather this many faculty and get to hear from um, expertise from across a range of disciplines and um, departments. And so if you have, um, we're, we're filling up more than even anticipated. Um, I think it's because everybody is definitely fans of Jesus and of women. That's what I'm feeling. Maybe a few of you, the small minority, are interested in extra credit as well. That's my guess. If you have open seats toward the middle of your row, would you consider moving in that way to open up some outside seats? That would be a gracious move. In fact, very welcome. I'll pause for a second to let that happen. If you're standing, please, please do find a seat. We're going to begin post haste. Again, I want to thank you all for being here. Our format for the evening is 10 speakers. How are we going to do that in two hours? Well, everyone is limited to speaking under 10 minutes each. And so I think that's one of the exciting things, to see if faculty can, in fact, stay within a time limit. We're grateful that you're here to witness this endeavor. Um, there will be refreshments and uh, an opportunity to gather to ask questions you have of the speakers afterward out in the lobby. And I want to thank particularly the faculty who have sacrificed of their time, who've been willing to share their expertise, and who have come out here and given a Tuesday evening for us all to learn better. Um, before I go much farther, I would like you all to smile for a photograph. Here we go. Smile, say cheese, say Phoebe the Apostle. Okay, no, she's not, well, she's not actually an apostle, I'm so sorry. Uh, she's a minister. Um, and now for all of us, I will pray, would the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let's begin. I'm delighted that we get to talk tonight about how gender studies are not incidental or even opposed to Christianity, but I think essential to it. And I want to start with a personal story, which is who I wanted to be when I grew up when I was five years old, and that would be Batgirl. There was nothing I could imagine to be more exciting. Um, look at her, strong, brave, glamorous, super smart, outwitting criminals, helping to make the world a better place. Um, I just couldn't imagine anything more wonderful than being a superhero like that, and in fact, would run around my house with a little walkie-talkie, I'm coming, Batman. Um, and so I was very excited about my future as a superhero. 
until a couple of years later, I happened to read this book um, about this young woman who lived about 100 years ago, grew up in the swamp lands of Florida, surrounded by alligators, very dangerous, very thrilling, um, and eventually made her way west. Her name was Esther Carson. She actually attended this university um, and studied languages. And when she was a young single woman in her late 20s, went to Peru and went into a part of the Andes where no outsiders had ever been before. And learned a language and began to, it was a language that had never been written down, and translated the gospel into this language. I was stunned, and of course, this totally appealed to me. This woman was beautiful and smart and bold and courageous, and she was a real-life superhero, but not anybody's sidekick, which was even better, and a superhero for Jesus, called to do great and amazing things for the sake of the gospel. This seemed like the kind of person I wanted to be. As I got older, I felt like um, that was not necessarily the model that other people had for me, however, particularly in the church, where I was often kind of felt like the message was be a little quieter, be a little bit less assertive or a little bit less bold. Um, and so it was really important to me as I grew up to discover the stories of a lot of other women, um, early American feminists who were also incredibly devout Quakers who were spurred to political action, first of all, um, in ending slavery and for abolition, women like Susan B. Anthony, um, Sojourner Truth, Alice Paul, women whose faith was the root of how they began working for social justice, but then also um, eventually got them involved in demanding women's rights as well. They became politically active in opposing slavery and injustices on behalf of others, and then also demanded the vote so that they could confront more injustices that they were discovering, things like child labor and sweatshops and the poverty and domestic violence that were a result of alcoholism and other social ills. So all of these women, including, as you'll see in that bottom image there, thousands upon thousands of nameless women who will never know over many, many decades who campaigned for the vote, for abolition, and for these other causes to make the world a better place for others as mothers, as Christians, as ordinary women who believed in a great cause and had the love of Christ in their hearts. And I realized that they weren't just asking for their rights, they were asking to be able to right wrongs. And I thought, these are my people. This is my tribe. These are the folks that I need to be like. So I hope that that's part of what we're going to experience here together tonight is looking for some of these women, these role models, these stories and voices that have been lost to us um, or erased or made invisible. But as we think about gender studies in Christianity, I think we need to not only fill in some of those gaps where women have been missing, we also need to think not just about gender, but about power. Because the differences between men and women, we're not trying to erase those differences, but we need to notice how those differences have not been equally valued. How women and femininity have often been on the losing end of freedom, of opportunity, of status, of respect, of equality. And men's experiences have often been overvalued or have had a greater share of power and resources. And I think this imbalance has been damaging for us all. I also want us to notice how um, identities, not just of male or female or masculine or feminine, but how those have intersected with race, with social class, with religion. And all of these identities have kind of come together and been used to um, construct and then be morphed and deployed into identities that limit us, that essentialize us, that put us into labels and boxes, um, that make us less able to be free to do the work of the Holy Spirit and the work that God is calling us to do. So I want to think a little bit about how men and women are created equally in the image of God, how we are equally beloved by God, and how God's heart is broken 
when women are devalued and exploited, when girls are denied education or married off as children, when women are trafficked or economically exploited, when women are the victims of violence. And I think gender studies can help us as Christians to better understand these issues and respond to them. So let me suggest one contemporary issue, just one of many, where I think a feminist perspective and a feminist critique could be really helpful. We are in a faith that really values bodies. We know that bodies matter. We know this because of the incarnation of our Lord Christ. We know this when we practice communion every single week in our churches. Um, and I think the church has done a great job of taking bodies seriously, and in particular taking women's bodies seriously, by protesting and resisting our larger culture's um, desire and um, kind of perpetuation of devaluing women's bodies, reducing us to our sexuality in pornography, in sex work, in ways that make us just things to be used, consumed, discarded. I think the church has done a great job of standing against that and resisting that understanding of women. But I think without a feminist critique, the church has done something that with the best of intentions, but kind of oblivious, has done a very similar move where we have overemphasized rather than underemphasized the preciousness of women's bodies and sexuality. And we've overemphasized sexual purity in ways that have created a culture for us in which women um, are supposed to equate our spiritual value with our virginity or our purity. That's their biggest measure of our Christian you know, commitment or something like that. Um, where women are blamed as victims of sexual violence because we tempted men or we were supposed to be able to control their responses to us somehow. Um, where a lot of repression and shame has come to women because of this overemphasis on sexual purity. And I think that we have actually, again, with a good intent, but we have done the same thing, just the flip side of the coin, where we have reduced women down to our bodies and our sexuality. And I think we would be much better served, and the church would have a much, much greater witness to the world if we could avoid that gender reductionism, and if we could instead fully and joyfully experience both the pleasure and the responsibility of our sexual expression, and we could fully value women, not just for their bodies and sex, but for all the gifts and calling that we bring. So, my faith needs feminism, and my feminism needs my faith because my feminism is deeply rooted in being able to see, mourn, and challenge those gender injustices and to persist in participating in God's transformative, healing, redemptive work in the world. Thank you. I love great history stories. I love stories of adventure and heroism, of revolutionary ideas, of courage and sacrifice. Even in a way, the heartbreaking stories, those of great injustice or tragedy, which remind us that we must not be silent in the face of evil, that although oppression has always existed, it has also always been fought against. Such stories give meaning to us and our lives. They inspire us to recognize what's wrong and strive for what's right. I'm a historian of US history and women's and gender history. So I'm going to use a US example here to illustrate why women's history matters and how it ultimately changes the story, not only of the past, but also of the present. Let's take something really big in US history, something we've all learned about before, the abolition of slavery. You know, of course, President Abraham Lincoln, who led the country through war and toward a new birth of freedom, the man who became known as the Great Emancipator. When he issued the Emancipation Proclamation halfway through the Civil War, it meant that a Northern victory would end slavery in the Confederate States. 
It was the Emancipation Proclamation that officially turned the Civil War into a war of morals, a battle between slavery and freedom. That is the basic version of the typical story, but it leaves us with many questions, and perhaps an inaccurate sense that Lincoln single-handedly freed the slaves. What that story doesn't tell us is how the Emancipation Proclamation came to be. When Lincoln entered office and the Civil War began, he didn't like slavery, but he also was not planning on abolishing it. It doesn't tell us how Lincoln reluctantly came to take such a big step halfway through the war, nor how white Northerners slowly, very slowly, became convinced of the moral righteousness of the anti-slavery cause in the years leading up to the war. It doesn't tell us why, even before the Emancipation Proclamation, Union soldiers were already marching south with a song on their lips, penned by the abolitionist woman Julia Ward Howe, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Glory, glory, hallelujah. In fact, we really can't explain the abolition of slavery without the parts involving women and black Americans, although the story was told that way for over 100 years. And because it was told that way, some Americans' understanding of the Civil War and its meaning slid in terrible directions over those years, directions that ignored the slavery and quest for racial justice at its foundation. So let me tell you more about how a group of women and men, black and white, slave and free, through the sheer power of their unrelenting demands, made it a war of emancipation. Here are the Grimke sisters. Sarah and Angelina, who took up pens instead of swords, but were no less heroes in the quest to end slavery. Daughters of an extremely wealthy South Carolinian planter who owned hundreds of slaves, the Grimke sisters felt from a young age the deep moral wrong of slavery. They became devout Quakers, moved north, and dedicated their entire lives to the abolitionist and women's rights movements. From the 1830s on, they spoke and wrote powerfully about the evils of slavery. Angelina became the first American woman ever to speak to a state legislature. And when they were condemned by northern ministers who called them promiscuous for speaking in public, they turned their attention to women's rights as well. <laughs> they and other 19th century women did this out of the deep well of their Christian faith. The Grimke sisters were the first American women to powerfully articulate biblical arguments for human equality. For being women who were bold enough to speak out against slavery, they were reprimanded by their church, just as other abolitionists were kicked out of their northern churches. But armed with the conviction that all people are made in the image of God, these women led one of the greatest, most transformative revolutions in all of human history, a revolution for equality and human rights, founded on the idea that there is no other moral course of action than to end all slavery immediately and permanently. As Angelina Grimke wrote in a letter to a friend, we abolition women are turning the world upside down. Let me repeat that. We abolition women are turning the world upside down. And it's true, the world would never be the same. Thirty years before the Civil War, very few white Northerners cared about the anti-slavery cause. Though there had always been black abolitionists, there were very few white ones at first. But in the 1830s, a small group of abolitionists, including the Grimke sisters and other Christian women and men, made white Northerners pay attention. At first, they seemed radical and wild, on the fringes. But for three, three decades, they kept up their fight giving speeches, writing essays and letters and books, demanding that the world hear that slavery was an abomination and violated the fundamental human equality that God had created. Although even men in the abolitionist movement were divided about whether to allow women in their organizations, these women persevered, deciding that along with dedicating their lives to abolition, they would also have to work to secure rights for women. And so those abolitionist women also started the women's suffrage movement, recognizing the ways in which freedom and equality for some are inextricably linked to freedom and equality for everyone. As a result of the unrelenting work of these abolitionists, 
Over the course of three decades, the sentiment of white northerners shifted dramatically in the direction of abolition. So that when the Civil War began, it was possible to even imagine that this war might represent freedom for slaves. Abraham Lincoln didn't see it that way at first. He initially saw it as a war for union, but by the middle of the war, both the efforts of abolitionists in the North and the movements of slaves themselves propelled him into the action that made him the great emancipator. In the North, former slaves wrote and spoke about the horrors of slavery, galvanizing the abolitionist movement. In the South, during the Civil War, enslaved Americans ran across Union lines and courageously insisted that the Union Army was an army of liberation, that the war was about freedom, well before Lincoln knew it was. Their actions, their movement demanded his response. I'd be hard pressed to think of an, a more amazing and courageous American than Harriet Tubman uh, during this time or really in any period of US history. Harriet Tubman was born into slavery but successfully ran away. Despite the extreme dangers, she returned to the South over and over again to lead more slaves, hundreds ultimately, along the treacherous journey to freedom. Known as Moses, she successfully led people to freedom, never losing one of them. She was a woman of indomitable courage, and on one occasion in the North, when she came upon a fugitive slave who was shackled and about to be returned to the South, she literally put her body in the way to stop the transportation of the enslaved man. During the Civil War, she worked as a spy for the Union and gathered crucial intelligence from the slaves of the Confederate South. She trained and led a group of men who essentially operated as a special forces unit during the Civil War. After the war, she campaigned for women's suffrage and fought for decades to receive her military pension. Women like Harriet Tubman and the countless, countless others who remain unnamed and silent gave meaning to the fight for freedom with their words and their very bodies. The story of the abolition of slavery is richer and more powerful when women are part of that story. It shows the significance of the actions of ordinary people, of the change we can make in the world. But finding and listening to women's voices means a lot of searching in the silence. We have to make a choice to include women and intentionally seek them out because for the most part they have been left out of the story. We know we'll never be able to fill in all of the silence, all the people on this planet whose stories never get told, but we can keep searching and what we find will change us. In the beginning, what was Eve's story all about? What was in the hearts and minds of those who heard it? When you read the text carefully, you'll find that a lot of her story in Genesis 3 through 4 has to do with her reproductive health, physical and emotional pains, her identity and worth being wrapped up in her ability to give birth to children, and the heavy, heavy grief of child loss. But since nearly the beginning of Christianity, Eve's story has been about sin and the fall. Was it Eve's fault? Was it Adam's fault? Who is to blame for sin entering the world? And what should women's roles be in the church and in society in light of this narrative? Within this conversation, Eve has been compared to Mary. Just as Christ was the new Adam, so was Mary the new Eve. By birthing the Savior, she fixed all that Eve had wrought in the world. That's why you'll notice in some artworks that Mary is crushing a serpent underneath her feet. It's the serpent that tempted Eve. This dichotomy between the Blessed Virgin Mary and the apparently sensual temptress, according to some, is exacerbated by the fact that Eve's story has been interpreted largely by men in cultures in which men held power. Thus, we get such helpful statements as that of Tertullian, who said around the year 200 CE, You are each an Eve. You are the devil's gateway. Because of you, the Son of God had to die. 
Such words are actually illustrative of the interpretive traditions against which women and those who care about us have been laboring for centuries. These are the visions of Eve with which Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Phyllis Tribble had to contend in their 20th century scholarly interpretations of Genesis. Can you see why? They had to toil away at showing that Eve's story does not celebrate women's subjugation, does not denigrate our intellectual cap capabilities, nor does it limit the way in which the spirit would work through us. So I give thanks for these women and others who have gone before me. Some of their stories you will hear today and others are yet to be told. It is with gratitude for the work they have done that I pose this question. What else could Eve's story be about? What more could she have to say? Indeed, what could God be saying to us through Eve? How about we stick with this comparison between Eve and Mary? They were both mothers. And there were mothers whose experience of motherhood included a great deal of pain and loss. For Eve, her story of motherhood really begins in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 16, when she's told, in pain you shall bring forth children. Some of the early Jewish interpreters caught on to the fact that this pain of bearing children wouldn't just be the moment of childbirth, but would involve the pains of being pregnant, the pains of becoming pregnant, the pains of losing a child, and the pains of raising a child. And so this verse, what we call a curse, represents the reality of all the types of pains that women may experience because we have given birth to children or our bodies might someday be able to. The story continues in verse 20. You see, Adam and Eve have just found out that they're mortal and all that that entails. And so Adam is looking around, perhaps in desperation, for a solution to this problem of humanity. And he sees the woman. He says, ah, oh, finally, this one can give birth to children. And so humanity will continue, despite the fact that she and I will die. And so he names her Chava, Zoe, Ava, Eve, life. Because she would be mother of all the living. And so in that moment, her very name is given to her based on the fact that she will be able to give birth to children. Her identity and her worth are wrapped up in that process. Imagine with me the weight of that upon her shoulders and the possibility of the empowerment of that. Now there's a little bit more to Eve's story and it's easy to miss because it has to do with the story of Cain and Abel. Now in that story, as you read it, neither Adam nor Eve are characters. And yet in verse 25, Eve writes herself back into that story. She's given birth to a child, and she names him Seth, saying, God gave me Seth because Cain killed Abel. She remembers and reminds us that the Cain and Abel story is also a story of child loss, in which she and Adam lost one child to death, and another to estrangement, for he was banished. In Eve's story, intermingled with pain comes eventually a deep joy, one that does not erase the grief of loss, but it commingles with it. Eve and Mary were both mothers who lost children. That's a story people can relate to, one which resonates in the hearts and minds of those who hear it. To those who have lost or fear losing young children or adult children, those who have experienced miscarriages of dearly wanted children, those estranged from their children, perhaps because they are incarcerated, those for whom the burden of having children or not having children seems too heavy to bear. Tell these stories. Write yourselves back into the stories that have been written without you. Tell your stories of maternal pain and joy, like the birth of my nephew, Bennett Isaac, who was a long-awaited child. And as we listen to the eaves among us, we will collectively breathe new life into the scripture that God has given us. We will identify with our first parents in deeply personal ways. Reclaim Eve's story, for haven't you heard that you are each an Eve?
When I was a little girl, we learned a song in church, and it went like this. Now brace yourselves. There were 12 disciples, Jesus called to help him, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, his brother, John, da, 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 Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, and Bartholomew. Woo, all right. I know. Thanks. As you can tell, I loved this song. I even added my own flourishes, as you just witnessed, the da-da-da uh, part. And its portrait of the followers of Jesus sunk in very deeply for me. In addition, in Sunday school, if we were ever asked to act out a Bible story and it called for a disciple, I'd always volunteer, yes, pick me. But I was told that, as a girl, I need not apply. Let's think about that for a moment. Our Christian imaginations could stretch to allowing a first century Aramaic speaking Jewish fully grown fisherman to be played by an eight year old suburban boy of European descent who had an American accent. But a female? No, that was a bridge too far. There were sometimes parts for girls in the stories we got to act out, but they didn't come around very often and they were always somebody's mom or their wife or their temptress. Uh, <laughs> the message was very clear. Girls are not disciples. Now I know that while that song wasn't incorrect and it's a handy memory tool, um, it was incomplete. And when we read Mark's gospel, my favorite gospel, and probably the earliest written account of Jesus' ministry, it's clear in several places along the way that the followers of Jesus who gathered around him after his baptism, who followed him as he ministered in his home region of Galilee, and who followed him as he made his final journey into Jerusalem, that these followers included many more than the 12 whose names were enshrined in that amazing song. While the number 12 certainly has significance, it symbolizes Jesus' reconstitution of the 12 tribes of Israel, these 12 men were not the only people who followed and were devoted to Jesus. In fact, as Mark tells Jesus' story, it's not until after he's crucified that we get a peek behind the scenes and we get to learn the identity of some of these followers who apparently were with them all along. After Jesus breathes his last breath, Mark 15, 40 through 41 says, there were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger and Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. Ah, there they are. Not only had there been other faithful men accompanying Jesus along with the 12, but there were women. Mary Magdalene, Mary, you know, James and Joseph's mom, Salome, these are just the ones Mark names. Matthew adds to the list also the mothers of the sons of Zebedee, and Luke remembers Joanna among their number. John's gospel tells us that at the crucifixion were present Jesus' own mother and her sister. It is these women, not Jesus' twelve and the other male disciples, with the notable exception of the disciple whom Jesus loves, who John tells us sticks with Jesus long enough to see him crucified, but from whom we don't hear again until the resurrection. It is these women primarily who are on record as the most tenacious and the ones who stick near Jesus in the most painful final episodes of his life. These women are the ones who stake out the tomb, figure out where he was buried, they're the ones that grab the anointing spices once the Sabbath is over in order to honor his corpse. They're the ones scared nearly to death when the stone they find rolled away from the tomb on Easter morning. And they're the ones who encounter the heavenly messenger or messengers who report that the same Jesus that they just saw crucified has now been raised to life just as he told them. It is the women's testimony, then, that is verified and told with remarkable consistency across all four canonical Gospels, even in the midst of their very different approaches and slightly varied lists of names. This should strike us as astonishing. These most critical, both historically and theologically, these most critical episodes in Jesus' life, these most, most traumatic moments, are preserved and passed on to us by Jesus' female disciples. They are the witnesses to the death and resurrection. It is 
Mary Magdalene, to whom Jesus entrusts the proclamation of his resurrection, according to John 20 and Mark 16. For this reason, Mary Magdalene has been called by church fathers and theological greats, including Pope Francis most recently, the apostle to the apostles. This recognition has, for many interpreters, myself included, sent me back to the Gospels to investigate Jesus' interactions with women from all walks of life. We find him reflecting in his own life the obedience that Luke first credits to his mother, Mary. We find that Jesus is ready and willing to heal women of all sorts of afflictions, even weird ones, okay? And so a child possessed by a demon— Jesus has got it. An adolescent who dies and leaves her family bereft and grieving, Jesus is there. A woman who has had an unceasing uterine hemorrhage causing a flow of blood for 12 years touches Jesus and is healed. They're restored to fullness of life. When Jesus teaches, women are never the butt of jokes that rely on the punchline, you know how women are, right? Wink, like that sort of thing. No, no. In Jesus' teaching, instead, women can even be examples, parabolic examples of who God is, like the woman who searches for a lost coin, just like God searches for lost people. Jesus teaches Mary of Bethany and refuses to allow her older sister to confine her role to that that the patriarchy has prescribed her, that of hospitality. No, she gets to learn. It is see, pardon me, it seems that Jesus' followers notice this too. This pattern, you know, of treating women as if they're full human beings created in God's image, participants in God's kingdom, yeah, that catches on. And so in Acts, at the coming of the Holy Spirit, Peter declares to a crowd, without caveat, without footnoted apology, like, oh, I know this is weird, guys, but no, he says it boldly. He proclaims that the prophecy that Joel had spoken is fulfilled right there, right now, And he says, in the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. When Paul and Silas venture into Asia Minor, proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, they meet a wealthy businesswoman. Her name is Lydia. She becomes a believer, and she welcomes them into her household. She takes, in doing so, a fairly significant risk. We find out in the next chapter that this is a serious offense to be associated with such ruffians. Paul mentions many women in his letters as well. For example, he credits Priscilla, whom we first meet in Acts. She's basically a seminary professor to poor Apollos, who doesn't have his act straight. She and her husband, Aquila our partners in ministry. And Paul speaks of them. He says that all the churches of the Gentiles, that includes us, owe them a debt of gratitude. Paul mentions many other women, and he calls them co-workers. Those are terms, co-workers in the gospel are terms he applies to Timothy and Silas, his steadfast partners in ministry. The names of these women include Euodia, Syntyche, Mary, Tryphena, Tryphosa, and Persis. Not terribly familiar, huh? Paul mentions Phoebe, who was a minister, that is in Greek, diakonos, who apparently is the one to deliver the profound and lengthy epistle to the Romans. She is the one entrusted with reading it to those congregations that Paul has never met, and she is the one entrusted with representing Paul in their midst. In the close of that very letter, Paul mentions extending a greeting to some of his kinfolk, apparently Jews that he'd served among, Andronicus and Junia. Paul calls them both apostles. He mentions their suffering for the Lord, and his respect and reverence from them is totally clear. Junia thus becomes the only woman who is named with the honored title apostle in the New Testament itself. Here we are, layers of interpretation and misinterpretation, passing time, cultural shifts. They have obscured many of these details when we talk about Jesus and his disciples, including those women who followed him directly and those who were the faithful foremothers who came shortly after. The list could go on. I could have named more people. Some Christian interpreters try to repair this perceived deficit by emphasizing, oh, Jesus welcomed women, but, you know, misogyny was rampant. Jews hated women. Greco-Roman culture was so hateful. They'd punch women who came across them thinking that this then makes Jesus look, whoa, even more welcoming compared to that. But we don't have to make other generations and different cultures into monsters in order to recognize what is true, okay? That Jesus respected and honored and treated as humans 
full humans, the people, the women that he encountered. His record speaks for itself, as do the ways that his followers included bold women and men who from the earliest days work together to advance the gospel. So let's instead turn our lenses of critique to our own culture that continues to put ill-fitting boxes around men and women that limit our potential and even our imaginations for what God might be about in this world. It's true that every culture will interact with scripture and read these bold followers of Jesus, whether male or female, in ways that say really more about us than they do about those followers. Nevertheless, Our readings of these women, from Mary Magdalene to Lydia to Junia to Jesus' own mother, Mary, owes them reverence and attention. The lack thereof is not only devastating to our own accurate understanding of scripture, of history and theology, but to the women and men here now in our own homes and in our churches. Let us tell the old stories of these faithful daughters anew in ways that are invariably, inescapably shaped by our own culture but with the intention of stretching our imaginations for what God's kingdom looks like. Thank you. I'm going to tell you the story about Macrina. There she is or at least what some Renaissance sculptor thought she probably should have looked like. Macrina, we know about because she had a couple of famous brothers, one of whom wrote her biography. His name was Gregory. If you want to read it, it's online in in a a not-so-good translation, but it's readable. It's not all that long. It won't take you very long. Macrina is famous in the history of Christianity, uh, mainly because of her connection to monasticism. Uh, She lived in the 300s, and let me tell you a few things about Macrina. Um, And the best way to do it is just to tell her story. Uh, She's a young woman, and as was the custom, um, she was betrothed to some guy um, of her father's choosing. That's how these things went in those days. Uh, She lived uh, in a very wealthy household by by the standards of the day, and so her life was fairly well mapped out for her. Fortune, God, providence, luck, or chance intervened, and the betrothed guy died. And Macrina saw an opportunity because Macrina had absorbed one of the chief values of early Christianity, and that was uh, the life of uh, rigorous asceticism. In other words, the uh, rather careful denial of bodily pleasures and things of that sort. For her, this is a very important life to undertake. Of course, this would be impossible if she were to be married. And so she thought, well, you know, maybe God stepped in here and opened a door for me. She somehow conned her father into allowing her to remain unmarried. She came up with something like, well, you know, the guy is supposed to marry. He's, he's not actually dead. He's up in heaven. So he's like, it's like he's still alive and I'm still engaged to him. And if you marry me off to someone else, then that's going to be weird, and let's not do that. And somehow, I don't know why, the biographer doesn't explain, the father went along with it, and it was okay. So Macrinus devotes her life then to living in the household and caring for her mother. The father dies uh, relatively early in the story. And Macrina convinces her mother to turn the household into a a female monastery. Uh, Remember, they're wealthy. So this is a self-supporting household. But, uh, and of course, there's no mention of the male slaves. I'm not sure what happened to them. But Macrina, her mother, and the female slaves constitute themselves as a kind of free and equal society of nuns, uh, the word we'd use today, and devote themselves to, uh, at least from the biographer's words, worship. That sounds like about all they did all day was worship. Um, Macrina is a virgin her entire life, and this qualifies her for the highest levels of Christian perfection. Uh, There's a kind of grudging acknowledgement that if you're not a virgin, you can attain some degree of perfection, somewhere down the food chain, but Macrina, being a perpetual virgin, occupies the highest degree. And uh, I'm I'm waiting for the next slide, or it's somewhere down the road here, but oh, also there's there's life. Uh, The next slide will show an icon of, of, um, of Macrina. Uh, oh, there she is. 
Again, no guarantee that's what she actually looked like. Uh, you know, these icons tend to be rather stylized. You may notice the little scroll in her right hand. Um, this is typically used in iconography to indicate um, wisdom. Now, Macrina had, uh, well, she did not have a university education as we would think about it, but because of her piety, her Christian perfection, uh, her insight, she is thought to have to possess divine wisdom, and so the scroll symbolizes that. The important thing for, about Macrina is this, well, I guess, let's say two things. One, she's fantastically important in the history of monasticism because she kind of creates this way of living monastically for women. Again, admittedly, she's rich, she can afford to do this, but it's a new form of monasticism uh, in which there is this equality at work, e even among the slaves. So everybody eats the same food, everybody dresses the same way, they all do the same kind of work, and Macrina even engages in manual labor, and so it, it's a society of equals. Uh, there's another angle to this, and that is that uh, in the fourth century, and actually until not recently, you know, um, it was the case that women did not have a lot of opportunity. As I said in the introduction, Macrina's life was fairly well mapped out for her, uh, as it would have been for the typical woman of the time. Uh, about the only women in the ancient world who had what we would think of as anything coming close to freedom would be wealthy widows. If you're wealthy and your husband died, you got the home base. You were self-determining and you could decide to do whatever you wanted to do. Otherwise, no, not at all. Um, but Macrina, by creating this household monasticism um, and somehow conning her father into allowing her not to get married off, um, symbolizes what some other Christian women did in that century and subsequent centuries, and that is uh, enter the life of the church and a life of perpetual virginity as an opportunity um, that they otherwise would not have. I mean, otherwise, they would have been married off. I mean, this was routine and normal. Um, it is so routine that ancient languages have one word that at the same time means woman and wife. Like, they typically don't have a, a separate word for wife, uh, wife for, from woman. It's al almost always the same word, because the assumption is, if you're an adult woman, or an adolescent woman for that matter, you're married. One of the things that Christianity does in the, fifth, fourth, in the fourth and fifth century is to open up some possibilities for women. Um, admittedly, by today's standards, still not all that broad in terms of opportunities. But if you have one opportunity in life and Christianity gives you a second one, you've doubled. And so uh, women, um, like under certain circumstances, were able to enter the life of the church. There was, for example, such a thing as the consecrated virgin. Uh, these are women who devote themselves to life within the church. We're not totally sure exactly what they did, although it seems to be some kind of service within the church. It's, the source is a little bit fuzzy on what they did. Uh, antecedents of this are probably found in 1 Timothy 5 with its talk about the widows. Um, but um, I'm not trying to lay out for you here as though Christianity were some all through its 20th centuries some great liberal uh, movement that just from the get-go opened up unlimited opportunities for women. But in the fourth century and around that time, uh, the, you know, the Christian church did open, open up some opportunities for women, such as the consecrated virgins, who otherwise would have just been married off. And for many women, that was probably okay. And even if it wasn't, they got married off anyway. But in this way, you could devote your life to God, find an alternative pathway in life, um, and at the same time, seek perfection. You could pursue the thing which your religion taught you was the highest of all possible goals. Uh, Gregory, Macrina's brother who writes her biography, goes into great length on this point. Uh, at several points, he just flatly tells the reader, Macrina and her mother and the household were living the life of the angels. They lived exactly the way the angels live, except for the, the fact that they, ha they happened to be living in bodies. Except for that, they were living the, the, the angelic life. 
Uh, 24 hours a day, it seems, they, all they do is worship. Right? They must have taken a few minutes here and there to eat, but that's about, that, everything was worship, just like the angels in heaven. They were unconcerned with worldly material things. Uh, one of Macrina's brothers dies, and Gregory goes out of his way to note that she was a, um, an athlete in this matter. She was not overcome by sorrow. Now, we might wonder if this is such a healthy thing to be, but by the standards of the day, this was, you know, Macrina had achieved something very great here. She had risen above the human plane of fears and passions and emotions and stuff like that and had attained, in a pretty literal way, the life of the angels. So, I'll end it here. Macrina presents to us a sort of an ambiguous character. Right? On the one hand, uh, like, like the, uh, the theme of the night is, you know, the women's struggle and valor, right? Well, she certainly exhibits this, right? I mean, with a fair bit of clever and, cleverness and intelligence as well. Um, so she exhibits a lot of valor and struggle in this quest for perfection, not without some problems by contemporary standards of what it means to be a Christian. I mean, today I think we would probably wonder about this perpetual virginity thing, why that should be such a great goal, but by the standards of the day, Macrina achieves something very great, and, and that's one reason why she's a saint and why she's pictured having a scroll in her hand, the scroll of wisdom. Thank you. Think women in the Middle Ages were uneducated and inactive? Well, think again, as that common misconception has been overturned by recent historical, literary, and religious scholarship that has illuminated female writings, resurrected forgotten works, and discovered hidden manuscripts. As a literature professor of the medieval and early modern eras, I will focus on two fearless, faithful medieval females who challenged stereotypes and strengthened my own faith journey by countering misogyny and providing a larger view of the divine workings and images than traditional male-centric ones that had formed my earlier education. One remarkable woman is St. Hildegard of Bingham, though she referred to herself as a timid little woman Born near the Rhine River in 1098, she began having visions at the age of five. And when she was eight, she was put in the care of the anchoress of a Benedictine abbey. Hildegard became a nun at age 14, studying scripture, the writings of the church fathers, philosophy, nature, science, and medicine. That was one of the privileges of being in a convent, was being able to be not only literate, but depending on the class of the convent, being able to read um, deeply in some of the works of the era. At age 38, she was elected abbess, and at 42 was told by God to write what you see and hear. After becoming seriously ill when she hesitated, she was healed when she started to write, and later on echoed back what God had told her, cry out and write. After becoming seriously, sorry, later she moved near Bingham with 18 nuns to start a new convent. A conflict with the church meant her convent could not sing, hear mass, or receive the Eucharist for a time. This interdiction against singing prompted Hildegard to write her musical compositions, and she became the most prolific composer of the Middle Ages. She also oversaw the creation of 42 visionary paintings, two of which I have displayed here. And if you could go back to the one before, this is a, this is a self-portrait of Hildegard receiving her visions from God. And the next is from her Hercebias, where it's the choir of angelic beings. Hildegard produced an outpouring of writings, including correspondence with the Pope, other church officials and rulers, whose return letters showed deep respect for her. She wrote major works on medicine and nature, on the virtues, and most, most famously, the Sivias, Know the Ways of the Lord, 
comprised of 26 visions in three major sections, creation, redemption, and the church. The work included Ordum Virtutum, a musical dramatic work and the first morality play ever written. Her writings use a wealth of feminine Im imagery. The cosmos is an egg, the church or synagogue as female, as are the virtues and the soul. Moving away from anthropomorphism, she also presents God through light and color and often uses universal pronouns. Though she sometimes uses traditionally masculine language for God, it is often combined with womb imagery or one or more females representing divine qualities or virtues. In Sevilla Book One, Vision Four, she records, I saw the image of a woman who had a perfect human form in her womb. And behold, by the secret design of the supernal creator, that form moved with vital motion so that a fiery, fiery globe that had no human lineaments possessed the heart of that form and touched its brain and spread itself through all its members. This passage depicts the creation of the human soul, which Hildegard terms the mistress of the body. Through the merging of the eternal female, the, the rem reminiscence of the Virgin Mary, and the brightness of God as creator. Another key mystic, writer, and theologian was Anchorus Julian of Norwich, who lived in England from 1342 to 1416. Following a near-death experience at age 30, she had a night of 15 visions, of which she wrote two versions, the short version to quickly record them, and a long version that took her 20 years of reflecting and writing. Though not a saint, she is still admired by Catholic, Anglican, and Episcopalian churches. May 8th is Julian of Norwich Day. And she inspired modern poets, including T.S. Eliot and Denise Levertov. After studying Julian in graduate school and beyond, and teaching her works for many years, I finally made a pilgrimage to Norwich with my spouse, and saw the church that housed her small anchorous cell, where she was sequestered for a life of reflection and writing, as well as offering counsel to the spiritually troubled. Kneeling in her room, I prayed for the kind of insight and love that she had expressed, and I read the visitor's book filled with comments of world travelers who had made this introspective woman's church a part of their own spir spiritual journeys. Julian uses common domestic images to convey her visions, drawing in readers of all educational level levels, and one might think that she wrote specifically for women. For example, she describes creation as being the size of a hazelnut in the hand of God, and the blood flowing from Christ's crown of thorns as resembling raindrops, beads, and even fish scales. Through her showings, she describes God as homely in his relationship to her and all of humanity. In Middle English, the term homely meant intimacy or familiarity, and was a term Julian used to show the relationship between God and us. In an age in which church hierarchy and the use of Latin often made God seem distant, distant and unreachable. Rhetorically, she deliberately constructs images that demonstrate this relationship by their own familiarity to the reader, thus forging a relationship between the mundane and the sacred, fusing the domestic and the transcendent. Julian is most renowned for her depiction of the second person of the Holy Trinity, drawing out gendered implications as she draws upon a host of antecedents in her presentation of Christ as mother, but surpassing her sources in development and depth of maternal imagery and implications. She draws upon both the domestic and bodily spheres as she vividly depicts Christ feeding his children as a mother breastfeeds her babes. And here she says, the human mother will suckle her child with her own milk, but our beloved mother, Jesus, feeds us with himself, and with the most tender courtesy does it by means of the blessed sacrament, the precious food of all true life. The human mother may put her child tenderly to her breast, but our tender mother, Jesus, simply leads us to his blessed breast through his open side, and there gives us a glimpse of the Godhead and heavenly joy the inner certainty of eternal bliss. 
This most primordial of instincts represents the most homely or intimate of relationships. At the same time, it invokes both the suffering of Christ through the blood in his side and Mother Church through the sacrament symbolizing that blood. In this metaphor, Julian draws directly from two maternal images Christ himself used. The first, found in Matthew 23, 37, portrays Christ as longing to gather his children of Israel the way that a hen would gather her chicks, snuggling them under her wings. And the second, and more related to the body of motherhood, is the John 3, 5 image of being born again, of re-entering the birth canal, only this time of the spiritual and not the physical realm. Christ embraced the feminine as he embraces his followers. In her portrayal of the love of God and God's desire for closeness to humans, it is fitting that Julian would choose the closest of human relationships in her analogy. Julian echoes Hildegard's earlier representation of Mother Church feeding her children, but merges Christ with that representation, as he is both the origin and source of continued sustenance of the believers. She conveys the love of God and concern for the well-being of the people in the midst of a time of suffering of plague, countering anxiety with all will be well and all shall be well and all manner of being will be well. And concluding that love was my Lord's beating. In my own life, reading Julian provided comfort eight years ago in a summer shaped by my cancer diagnosis. These two women are but a small representation of the rich resources of medieval female religious writers who continue to offer new ways of viewing the Holy Trinity, relationships with the divine, and ways of being embodied believers, and they have enriched my spiritual journey. For decades now, I've kept company with women writers, their resistances and their dreams for a reformed world. My own journey may have gotten its start when my grandmother gave me a book called Sweet Girl Graduate. I didn't know the significance of the book or the author then. I was just excited to get a gift from my grandmother. I read and loved the book. In fact, I still have that book 45 years after she gave it to me. Did my grandmother give it to me because she saw the intellectual girl of the heroine in me? Or did she want to awaken her? Did reading Sweet Girl Graduate awaken her in me? I don't know. But I do remember reading about Priscilla, Prissy, Pennywern, Peel, having a trunk packed for college and a fireplace in her college sitting room, heady imaginings for 14-year-old me. I've never forgotten those images. It was only later in graduate school that I learned something about L.T. Mead's story, a prolific 19th century woman writer who, like so many of the women writers with whom I have kept company, has been eclipsed by the male writers history takes pains to remember and record. There are stories about my grandmothers too in the details of the inscription of my book. My grandmother was born in 1898. My great grandmother first gave the book to my grandmother in 1917 for her 19th birthday making my grandmother the same age as the heroine of the book. Perhaps Mama Smith was trying to awaken or recognize the intellectual girl in her daughter, too. And my grandmother, signing the book with all of her names, Artie, what a cool first name, Smith Wilkes Jowett, tells the story that women have long been grappling with their multiple identities and names, 
just as we do today. A lifetime of reading women writers has taught me so much about women and Christianity, about resistance and reform. Amelia Lanier wrote in 1611 of Jesus' attitude and treatment of women that it pleased him to be begotten of a woman, born of a woman, nourished of a woman, obedient to a woman, and that he healed women, pardoned women, comforted women, appeared first to a woman, and sent a woman to declare his most glorious resurrection to the rest of his disciples. Rachel Spate wrote in 1617 that Eve was not produced from Adam's foot to be his low inferior, nor from his head to be his superior, but from his side, near his heart, to be his equal. An argument feminist theologians continue to make in the 20th and 21st centuries. Margaret Fell, in 1616, lists the same spiritual women leaders in the Bible to which modern feminist theologians point. And she exposes the cultural and historical limits of passages like those in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2, still wrongly used to silence women. She exhorts her readers, stop that opposing spirit that would limit the power of the spirit of the Lord Jesus, whose spirit is poured upon all flesh, both sons and daughters. Mary Astle clarified in 1700 the crucial difference between descriptive, foretelling what would be, and prescriptive, determining what ought to be material in the Bible, and declared, whatever other great and wise reasons men may have for despising women and keeping them in ignorance and slavery, it can't be from their having learnt to do so in Holy Scripture." The Bible is for and not against us, and cannot without great violence done to it be urged to our prejudice. Catherine Sawbridge Macaulay Graham, concerned with women's inferior education and its overemphasis on chastity, wrote in 1790 that reason in all matters which concern their duty and happiness is the only sure guide to virtue. And in 1792, the great Mary Wollstonecraft asserted one standard of virtue alone for both women and men, writing this, Gracious creator of the whole human race, hast thou created such a being as woman who can trace thy wisdom in thy works and feel that thou alone art by thy nature exalted above her? For no better purpose can she believe that she was only made to submit to man, her equal, a being who, like her, was sent into the world to acquire virtue? Can she consent to be occupied merely to please him, merely to adorn the earth, when her soul is capable of rising to thee? Charlotte Bronte declared in 1847, that women feel just as men feel. They need exercise for their faculties and a field for their efforts as much as their brothers do. They suffer from too rigid a restraint, too absolute a stagnation, precisely as men would suffer, and it is narrow-minded in their more privileged fellow creatures to say that they ought to confine themselves to making puddings and knitting stockings, to playing on the piano and embroidering bags. In 1860, Florence Nightingale wrote this, Jesus Christ raised women above the condition of mere slaves, mere ministers to the passions of men, raised them by his sympathy to be ministers of God. He gave them moral activity. But the age, the world, humanity must give them the means to exercise this moral activity, must give them intellectual cultivations, spheres of action. Christina Rossetti, the matchless Christina Rossetti, created in 1864 a stunning picture of a Eucharistic female savior in her goblin market lines, eat me, drink me, love me, Laura, make much of me, for your sake I have braved the glen and had to do with goblin merchantmen. 
In the mid-1800s, Emily Bronte, Francis Power Cobb, George Eliot all confronted faith and doubt in their writings, each one coming to her own unique conclusion about Christian belief and womanhood. By 1894, Sarah Grand asserted a need for a new man to correspond to the new woman, saying this, we come confidently to maintain not that this or that was intended, but that there are in ourselves in both sexes possibilities hitherto suppressed or abused, which, when properly developed, will supply to either what is lacking in the other. In 1928 and 29, Virginia Woolf, preparing for a lecture to college women, noted the gaps in 16th and 17th century women's history and the profound difference between women in fact and women in literature. She said this, Woman pervades poetry from cover to cover. She is all but absent from history. She dominates the lives of kings and conquerors in fiction. In fact, she was the slave of any boy whose parents forced a ring upon her finger. Some of the most inspired words, some of the most profound thoughts in literature fall from her lips. In real life, she could hardly read, could scarcely spell, and was the property of her husband. Dorothy Sayers, in 1947, remarked on Jesus' straightforward, uncondescending treatment of women as full human beings. There are so many more resisting and reforming women writers. But I think you get the picture. Of the Bible, Madeline Lingle wrote in 1993, Scripture was written in a masculine world, which is a sign of things skewed and out of order. The God of Scripture is seen through male eyes, Jacob, Moses, David, so what we are given is only a partial vision of God. While keeping company with all these women writers, I've kept company with Scripture too. And both of them together have shaped my feminist reading of Scripture, urging me to more inclusive versions of the Bible. When Alison Jewell and I decided to create a book of essays about being feminist, being Christian, we felt sort of like we were telling a brand new story, our story. But we were, in fact, adding a chapter to a very old story indeed. In our second book, we wanted to tell frank stories about facing the challenges of living out a feminist and Christian commitment. All these stories are the stories of women resisting, women reformed, and we'll keep on living them. Keep on telling them for those who have ears and hearts to hear them. Forty years ago, I was a student here. I had heard that the Church of the Nazarene ordained women to preach and to teach, but I never saw one. There were no women in the faculty in the religion department. There was no woman chaplain. So I knew that there was such a thing as a preaching woman. But like a rare bird in the Amazon, I didn't know what one looked like or sounded like, but I was on the lookout. <laughs> Eventually, I went to seminary, and I picked one that had a handful of female professors and a woman dean. And while I was there and I was preparing to write my master's thesis, I tried to find a book on early Nazarene women preachers so I could learn and read about them then because I wanted to write about now. I might not know many women preachers, but I could find a book about them, right? Wrong. 
But conversations led me to yellow folders in the Nazarene archives. Most of the stories of women I wanted to read about had not been told. So I dug through old letters, church records, and wrote my thesis, Ordained Women in the Church of the Nazarene, the First Generation. These women were dead long before I was born, but they became some of my very best friends in ministry. Mary Lee Cagle, a native of Alabama, felt called to preach at a young age, but was told by her mother she'd rather see her in her grave than to be a missionary. But the spirit persisted, and Mary began to preach and plant churches in 1894. E.J. Sheeks from Kentucky heard a woman preach at a Methodist camp meeting at 18. This freed her to imagine that she could preach and teach. She did, and she started a rescue home. In her 30s, she went to college and learned, earned a bachelor's in theology. And in 1925, she began teaching for Brzee College. And then Olive Winchester from Massachusetts graduated from Radcliffe, Radcliffe College in 1902 and was the first woman to receive a divinity degree and to be ordained in Scotland and in all of Great Britain. She taught biblical languages at Nazarene institutions for four decades and ended her career here at what is now called Point Loma Nazarene University as Dean of the Graduate Division of Religion from 1935. To 1947. What? <laughs> Why did no one tell me about these women? And so now I was really on the search. I slowed down, read carefully, and listened. And I began to find spirit led women everywhere, in all centuries preachers, teachers, prophets poets. I was ever on the hunt for women called and gifted by the Spirit who left traces for me and for others to follow. Here's one story of a woman I found in Wales. In a Celtic Christianity course in 2000, I heard a small mention of Anne Griffiths, a young Methodist Calvinist hymn writer. What? <laughs> How did she join these two theological streams together? Why was she remembered and spoken of with such reverence, such love? I vowed one day I would return to Wales to find her. On my sabbatical in 2017, I returned to an amazing residential library where you sleep bed and breakfast style and meet interesting people from all over the English-speaking world. On my first day, the librarians led me to the shelf of Welsh hymnody. All but three books were in Welsh. The three that were in English were about Anne Griffiths. As I read, I repeatedly encountered geographical names. Powys, an ancient kingdom, now a sparsely populated region of Mid-Wales. Donalog, the nearest town to Anne Griffith's home with a small chapel built in her memory. Ling Fenangle ing Nofwinga, the village where she was baptized, married, and buried. Dolwar Fach, the name of the family farm and the River Virni, the local river that, wen that wends through the area. And I also discovered in my 17-year absence that there was a seven-mile walking path established. It's called the Anne Griffiths Pilgrimage Route. But how would I get there? Could I follow the map that's all these weird Welsh names? I would need to rent a car. My husband agreed to drive if I would navigate, and we were off. Anne Thomas Griffith lived her short 29 years at Dolwar Fatch. The youngest of five children, she learned to read and write Welsh through the church school. 
She was tutored for a brief time in English and managed rudimentary writing skills. In the summer of 1796, as the story goes, Anne went to a nearby town to go dancing. There she meet, met a friend who invited her, instead of dancing, to come to the independent chapel. For the first time, she heard a description of sin and a call to accept true religion. And by 1799, Anne had joined the Methodists, keeping her Calvinist beliefs, and was hosting, cooking, and making socks for the itinerant preachers that traveled and stayed at her farm. A couple of years earlier, when she was very young, her mother died. Within a few years, her father died too. At 28, Anne married a local farmer named Thomas Griffiths, but this is not a happily ever after story. A short 10 months after her wedding, she gave birth to Elizabeth, who survived just a few days. Anne outlived her daughter by a week. Death also claimed her husband within a couple of years. How could this sad tale of lives cut short be the story of one of Wales' celebrated literary poets and gospel hymn writers? Anne, it turned out, was a hidden poet. She wrote on scraps of paper, and if she was caught while writing, she would hide the scraps of poetry in the drawer, inside a book, under the furniture. She wrote for herself, and she did not think others would find her words useful. But her friend and helper in the house, Ruth Evans, found some of her poems, and she sang them using popular tunes of the day. It was Ruth, her friend's memory, and the oral and singing culture of Wales that enabled Anne's poetry to outlive her. 34 hymns and eight personal letters. That's what remain. It's the stuff of legends. A young hidden poet's work is sung by a farm maid and written down by some itinerant preacher. But over the centuries, her work miraculously reaches us. In 2017, as we traveled the narrow roads where Anne had lived, we found it difficult. After more than an hour, we headed up a narrow road and stopped after many twists and turn to confirm with some teenagers that we were still heading toward Lynn Finangle and Griffith's home. Stony faces nodded. My husband, Michael, said to me, they have no idea what you just asked them. <laughs> I said, maybe they do. And around another blind corner, we saw a group of people gathered near a pub. Yes, they pointed to a nearby church. That's where Ann Griffiths is buried. A nice woman said, and make time to stop at Lake Verney. In the graveyard, I found the obelisk atop Ann's grave, and I stopped to pay attention. Birds sang, sheep bleated, the sky was filled with billowing clouds. Little had changed over the centuries. I sensed the peace of this place, and I paused to give thanks for the life of Ann Griffiths, her husband, and their tiny daughter. We found Donna Log in the memorial chapel where busts of Ann top the modest pillars. A hymn book was open from recent use the congregation was still singing her songs. Outside a road marker pointed to Lake Verney. We were hungry and expected a nice view, but found a magical place. The woman who sat across from us at dinner said, it looks like the castle on the lake from Disney's movie Frozen. <laughs> and yeah, it kind of did. Throughout her 28 years, Anne Griffith walked many miles along the River Verney. Being in her local surroundings gave her poetry, her hymns, her theology, texture, and pathos. Anne Griffith wrote poetry to help her understand what she was learning and experiencing about God. She had no idea 
that anyone would stand 214 later, years later and read some of her words. So now, all this time after her passing, she, a pilgrim, learned from her faith, wrote it down. And now we, pilgrims, long ago, long past her time, can enjoy the beauty of her praise. O oh, eternal rest in rapture, when I labor here no more, found within that sea of wonders where one never sees a shore, coming into life abundant where the three in one is mine, boundless sea to swim forever, now one, the human and divine. There are so many stories to find, so many stories to tell. We are their storytellers. I'm grateful. Even a much longer talk about women theologian to, theologians today would demand a great deal of selectivity and difficult choices because there are so many wonderful and inspiring people about whom one could speak. But in so brief a compass as this, it makes sense to stay within the Wesleyan theological tradition of which Point Loma is a part, and that's what I'll do in this presentation. Regardless of tradition, however, any talk about women theologians today has to begin with a true pioneer of the 20th century, the Methodist theologian Georgia Harkness. The first woman to teach theology in any American seminary, by the way, including the one where Dr. Laird wrote that master's thesis, although I think she was there before you. Um, Harkness swam upstream all of her life. When she wrote what's on the screen here, it's, it is a paradoxical fact that the Christian gospel has done more than any other agency for the emancipation of women, yet the church itself is the most impregnable stronghold of male dominance, you can rest assured that she was writing from a long litany of personal experiences. Among the first women to be ordained by the Methodists, she had to fight hard for decades for women to be allowed access to Methodist pulpits. In an essay entitled, The Ministry as a Vocation for Women, uh, mid-20th century essay, she threw down the gauntlet. To those who fear that we women would not make a success of the ministry, we reply, try us and see. <laughs> Is there anyone who really believes that a woman with proper training cannot preach as good a sermon as a man? We wonder if advancing the kingdom is not more important than maintaining an ancient prejudice. By the way, she was also a committed Christian pacifist and social activist, having written her master's thesis on the topic of the church and immigration. She remains relevant on many counts. Georgia Harkness also wrote hymns. I thought Dr. Laird was going to sing from... Um, probably her best known hymn is Hope of the World, and since we have had a little bit of a concert uh, atmosphere here tonight, I thought I'd contribute with just a verse of this great hymn... <clears throat> Hope of the world, God's gift from highest heaven, bringing to hungry hearts the bread of life. Still let thy spirit unto us be given to heal earth's wounds and end her bitter strife. Amen. In 1948, at the first assembly of the World Council of Churches held in Amsterdam, Harkness took on the world-famous theologian Karl Barth on the topic of human equality. Barth held an, held an unapologetically stark notion of the priority of men over women in God's created order, and Harkness challenged him publicly in rather heated debate. Several years later, when someone asked Bart if he remembered Harkness, he replied, remember me no more of that woman. <laughs> but remember her we do this evening and with great gratitude. Harkness surely helped pave the way for another Wesleyan theologian, perhaps the most important one that the Church of the Nazarene has produced, Mildred Bangs Weinkoop. 
From her groundbreaking work, A Theology of Love, The Dynamic of Wesleyanism, we read these words. If one is committed to a Wesleyan theology, she must realize that her commitment is to a theology of love. Love is fellowship, relationship, and sociality. When St. John said, God is love, something was said about the nature of God and about the nature of humanity that begins to make sense of the word personal. Weinkoop, whom I was privileged to have as a teacher at Nazarene Theological Seminary, challenged her church to think beyond narrowly conceived doctrine and prepackaged ideas about religious experience. She emphasized the deeply relational quality of biblical language of love for God and neighbor, acknowledging that love and relation are terms of dynamism that resist easy categorization. This made many of her fellow Nazarenes deeply nervous. However, it did not seem to bother or hinder her in the least. Her recasting of Wesley's theology in a way that resonated especially with the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber's classic work, I and Thou, helped to propel her work into an unusual degree of influence, not only among many of her fellow Nazarenes, but also among Christians both within and also beyond the Wesleyan tradition. One of the many theologians uh, who has expressed appreciation for Weinkoop's theology of love is Marjorie Hewitt Suhaki, a remarkably buoyant thinker and personality. Raised in a non-religious home in the Boston area, Suhaki first came to Christian faith during her teen years as a result of hearing Billy Graham preach during an evangelistic crusade. This citation from her book, Divinity and Diversity, nicely summarizes many of Suhaki's enduring themes. To consider God relationally is to think of God continuously acting from love, luring the world toward its good through the means of ever newly given guidance. But God works in a relational world, and in a relational world, saving grace is invitational. In John Wesley's words, it is resistible grace. This is why the response of faith is so important. Suhaki has been a daring and adventurous thinker in engaging such issues as the problem of evil, human sin, understood primarily as violence against the goodness of creation, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, the nature of the afterlife, prayer. Uh, Her book on prayer, by the way, entitled In God's Presence, is fantastic. I recommend it to all of you. She also wrote about preaching and religious pluralism. The list is quite long. When she was recruited back in the 1980s to become dean of the faculty at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., a United Methodist seminary, she wasn't recruited because she was a Methodist, because she wasn't. But in her new position, she found that she was receiving lots of requests to come and speak to Methodist ministers in the D.C. area about John Wesley. So she thought perhaps it'd be wise for her to begin reading a little bit of John Wesley and in the process became a convinced Methodist. Her ability to present the ideas of Wesley's little book, A Plain Account of Christian Perfection, both in her writing and in her oral presentations remains very much in the category of masterpiece. Nearly 20 years ago, we were privileged to have Marjorie Suhaki as a guest lecturer here at Point Loma, where she said, among other things, that we are each Adam and each Eve to the generations that follow us. Marjorie Suhaki has been a profoundly inspiring Eve to many theologians, both women and men, who have learned from her teaching and her embodying of a deeply relational theology. And I count myself blessed to be among those people. Finally, another theologian who considers uh, Suhaki to be one of her mentors and guides is the preeminently brilliant Catherine Keller, who wrote of Suhaki upon her retirement that her legacy has consisted of philosophical precision, social analysis, and feminist relationalism practiced together cheerfully. Keller certainly has extended and deepened those values of philosophical precision, social analysis, and feminist relationalism, except largely without the cheerful part. But that's all right. With Keller, we encounter a thinker too deep and too brooding to be very cheery. 
Her often dense prose always rewards the careful reader with creative insights, lodged in clever puns and word plays, one of the reasons I love her, subtle humor and deft literary, philosophical, and psychological references. She is a trip, worth taking. I admit often to having what I like to call a theological crush on Katherine Keller. There, I said it. <laughs> I've chosen a relatively tame quotation from one of Keller's most amazing, and I do mean amazing, like it's a maze, uh, books. <laughs> a book entitled Face of the Deep, A Theology of Becoming. And she asks, have interpretations of the book of Job shown the same obtuseness from which the creator spirit rouses Job? Do we yet care when the antelope calves or how the wild ass scours the hills for green? Do we consider their lives, their patterns of eating, mating, birthing, and moving to be so far beneath the dignity of theology, so much less important than human suffering, so much less interesting than human discourse that we politely skim the poetics of creation. She's asking more or less, after reading Job, do we still overlook or suppress the wildness, the mystery, the unpredictability and complexity of God's vast creation? Do our theology still prefer to ignore the God who speaks to Job from the whirlwind of the unmanageable intricacies of our unimaginably vast universe. That, my friends, is why Catherine Keller is so very cool. And I thank God, I truly do, for these four women and how they have enriched our faith and our lives by the divine gifts they have shared with us. Amen. Mary, Miriam in Aramaic, the language she spoke, was about 15 when she got pregnant. The angel Gabriel said to Mary, Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary responded with a song we call the Magnificat. Perhaps you've heard parts of it at Christmas time. When I was about 15, I was voluntold by my church choir leader to sing Mary's Magnificat at a Christmas cantata. The words I still remember went like this. I will not be singing it. I will rejoice in my God. I will rejoice in my Savior. I will magnify the name of the Lord forever and ever. But the song I was taught stopped short of Mary's prophetic vision. We often do not get to hear the rest of the song, which says, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Writer D.L. Mayfield has noted how German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer described the Magnificat as the, quote, the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary hymn ever sung. Mayfield also wrote that Father Gustavo Gutierrez, who coined the phrase liberation theology, wrote that Mary's song highlights that God gives special attention to the poor and the oppressed, those who are cast out by society. Why did Mary utter these words after finding out about God's plan for Jesus taking over a throne? Why would talk about a throne matter at all? we can begin to understand when we consider the context. Nazareth, where Mary lived, was a small village in the city of Galilee. At the time of Jesus' conception, much of Galilee 
was in open revolt against Roman imperial rule, especially in the town of Sepphoris, a town four miles away from Nazareth, about an hour's walk. For example, because of the protests in Sepphoris, the town was burned down and its inhabitants were sold into slavery. Nazareth, up a hill, saw the smoke below. It is not random that Jesus was born among people who were experiencing discrimination, labor exploitation, and oppression from empire. The arrival of Jesus was indeed good news for people who were suffering. He was going to shake things up. Mayfield also wrote of Ben Wildflower, whose art I show here. Upon learning about the deeper meaning of Mary's words, the artist was shaken, or shook, if you prefer. (laughs) He was inspired to depict Mary stepping on a snake with a raised fist. What might God reveal to us if we seriously meditated on Mary's Magnificat? Feminist liberation theologians around the world might help us answer that question. Yvonne Guevara from Brazil holds doctorates in philosophy and religious studies. Her theology, however, did not develop only in academic context, but also with her daily life alongside impoverished women in Latin America, whose struggles intersect along race, class, gender, and earth domination. She critiques the supposed anthropological superiority of human beings over all creatures, and the assumed subjugated dependence of women on men. Guevara contributes an eco-feminist theology that connects ecological health to social justice. Ghanaian Methodist theologian Mercy Amba Uduyuye is affectionately called the mother of African women's theologies. She teaches and writes about poverty, healthcare, youth empowerment, and women's rights. She is the founder of the Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians. The circle deals with the destructive impacts of Western neocolonialism on the continent and also to their cultures. They questioned the romanticization of African cultures and its oppression of women and the sexism of Christianity linked to colonization. In the Philippines, where I'm from, Feminist theologians take on the issues of dictatorship and economic repression. They too courageously confront the country's history of Christian conversion coupled with violent Western colonization. Sister Mary John Mananzan, having earned her degrees in Germany and then in Rome, also walks alongside the people at marches and protests, for example. She identifies as a political and feminist activist, advocating for women's rights and the concerns of women who have been raped or trafficked for tourists and the military. Korean feminist liberation theologians also face similar issues. The Korean liberation theology in the 1960s, called the Minjung theology, ignored gender issues. So Christian feminists highlighted the abuse of women in the sex tourist trade, as well as demanding reparations for the Korean women who were enslaved for sex during World War II. Chung Hyun Kyung, a lay theologian of the Presbyterian Church of Korea, has written, quote, doing theology is a personal and a political activity. As a Korean woman, I do theology in search of what it means to be fully human in my struggle for wholeness and in my people's concrete historical fight for freedom, end quote. Indian feminist theology also confronts issues regarding the designated low status of women in society, evident in the matter of what's called dowry deaths. Dowry death is the phenomenon of a bride being murdered by her husband so that he can collect more dowry from another bride's family. To teach both young women and men to respect each other and themselves, Kochurani Abraham in Kerala, India, is filling the need for gender and sexuality education in schools. She has training in child development, systematic theology, and feminist theology. 
She also teaches workshops integrating sexuality and spirituality for both youth and adults. I am grateful to American feminist scholar and Catholic theologian Rosemary Radford Ruther for writing about them all. Across the globe, the shared interests and intentions of Christian women theologians include critiquing sexism in Christianity and in Christian churches, and reconstructing the hierarchical, male-designed, male-centric symbols for the divine. They also draw on resources from their cultures to speak truth and power to the issues that are particular to their societies and histories, some of which, frankly, we are complicit, if not the cause. Feminist liberation theologians see their work that in affirming women's full and equivalent humanity, they affirm a God who is loving, just, and whole. Shaken as you might become if you seriously meditate on Mary's song, I hope you join the chorus of our diverse voices, praising God for the hope of Jesus towards our collective liberation. Thank you. It's important to hear many voices. I hope you've appreciated the scan of history tonight, the way that many voices you may not have heard before have been brought to us. We're going to end tonight by asking all of us to join our voices in reading together the litany to honor women that's found in your um, program. Why don't you stand up? You've been standing, you've been sitting a long time. And I'm going to invite you to be the ones who read boldly in bold. So you begin, and then I will follow. So here we go. Dr. Lodal's going to lead you. One, two, three. testifying with ferocity and faith to the spirit of wisdom and healing. They are the judges, the prophets, the martyrs, the warriors, poets, lovers, and saints who are near to us in the shadow of awareness, in the crevices of memory, in the landscape of our dreams. Who judge the Israelites with authority and strength. who used her position as queen to ensure the welfare of her people. Who kept and cradled the wisdom of the ages. Who audaciously sought her healing and release. who wept at the empty tomb until the risen Christ appeared, who led an early church in the empire of Rome, whose witness in the third century led to her martyrdom, who resisted death with persistence and wonder, who had imagination and theology proclaiming, all shall be well. Who Who stood against oppression, righteously declaring in 1852, ain't I a woman? Who Who turned their grief to strength, standing together to remember the disappeared children of war with holy indignation. Who Who named the lavender hume a womanish strength. Who Who teach us to resist evil with boldness, to lead with wisdom, and to heal. 
Go, and thank you for coming.